All righty. Good evening, everyone. I am Lauren Gates, your host of this evening's special Airway Health Solutions Conversation Series. We're back from after our summer break. We have Dr. Michael Gelb and Dr. Lane Martin with us tonight, and our topic of discussion is night guards. There's a lot of controversy and curiosity out there. So the topic is, are they good or bad for the airway? Uh, we are so thrilled to offer this event with free CE and recordings as part of Airway Health Solutions, Airway Health Movement. So welcome, Dr. Gelb. Welcome, Dr. Martin. I, it's funny to call you that. We're so uh, informal. So is it okay? I'll just go with Michael and Lane. It's okay with you guys? Sure. Perfect. Because sure. I have to really think about saying that, and I don't want to think too much tonight. I just want to make sure we answer all the questions. Why don't we um, just start with an informal introduction? Um, a lot of people know who you are, but I think maybe more there's a curiosity on how um, you also started working together. So um, whoever wants to take the floor, why don't you just do a brief introduction and like um, discuss how you guys became um, partners in crime here? I'll just tell the very quick one, Lane, and then yeah. I'll let you the real. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I was to maybe switch office locations and my friend Lloyd Harris had told me what a beautiful job Lane had done with his practice in his office and I went up there and I asked him if I could come by and I think that's really is that that's when we met for the first time Lane right yeah and, and I showed me around and then uh, I'll let you then I'll, I'll let you take it from there so yeah I was in a restorative dental practice on actually I got out of a practice. I built a new location on Central Park South. And that's how I met Michael initially. I knew who he was, like probably everyone on this podcast does. But what happened was after a while, I ended up selling my restorative dental practice. I went into ortho, full-on orthodontic and craniofacial orthopedic residency at CTOR in Hoboken. Okay. And what happened was I noticed that a lot of my adult ortho patients who were skeletal class two, their mandibles or trap back had significant TMD problems. And I obviously knew who Michael Gelb was. So I reached out to Michael. I said, could I see what you're doing in terms of treating these patients? He was so accommodating. He's like, come in, take a look. I went in there and I realized what Michael is also doing, which is why working with Airway Health Solutions is so great. He's using orthodontics to really help mitigate symptoms. And what happened was we started out as kind of a learning management system about teaching TMJ, airway, and ortho. And that's how we kind of collaborated together, created our appliance, and now working with you guys on really helping the solution. Well, we're thrilled to be partnered with you guys now. It just seemed like a natural um, partnership and we're so excited to just go over. Maybe it'll come to light why we're partners <laughs> by the end of this conversation, how it all fits together. Um, I know I love, Michael, how you say it's the prequel to ortho, really night guards. And um, there are all different kinds out there. So uh, without spoiling you know, the spoiler event of the topic tonight, um, was there anything else, Michael or Lane, you wanted to say about yourselves or anything? Thing that you thought anyone should know well not not so much about myself but it will end up being talking of course about <laughs> myself that um traditional dentistry has been really about flat night guards or cuspid guided or you know dentistry came from terminal hinge and i think lane we have a slide on that tonight and gelb has always been associated with three-dimensional repositioning and I think if you didn't agree with it in terms of TMJ, which I guess I could partially understand that, but not really. So there's a lot of people out there that don't think you should ever change someone's bite. They think if you're born with a bite, that's the bite you have. God forbid, don't change that bite. And prosthodontists are really guilty of that. And once you understand what Ben talks about, once you understand what Kevin Boyd talks about, once you understand what Lane talks about, once you understand the work of Coraccini, Weston Price, Lieberman from Harvard, James Nestor, and we can go Mariana Evans, we can go on and on and on. Once you've ever looked at a skull at a museum that's greater than 500 years old, and now if you are observant at all and you look at the children coming in, I think you see that our faces have changed. 
I think we're not dealing with the same set of jaws, the same set of skulls. And so the part of the United States, the part of dentistry that thinks that your occlusion, like when I was at Columbia, they said, you cannot change vertical dimension. You should not change someone's occlusion. And there's very famous people in the city that do laminates. I mean, they do, they've got huge practices with models and actresses and they never change the occlusion on the second molars. They never change the occlusion on the, on the posterior teeth. It's really a cosmetic practice and it's all about aesthetics. And they do a nice job on the upper jaw, but I think people don't really. And so when Lane came to me and he understood and he with, with kids was doing buildups and bite blocks and moving the jaw forward. And, and I know, and I work with Ben Moralia for two years, you know, personally on my patients in my, and Ben shows these cases. I think that's what I really want to, that's the point I want people to take home is that we're not about flat plane. We're not about upper flat plane appliances that have cuspid guidance. And we, we want to discuss that and we're happy to open it up for discussion. And so, you know, Lane, you have people that have been trained at Spear. You have people that have been trained at Kois. We have people that have been trained at Panky, Dawson. And I've talked to Whit Wilkerson about this. And I talked to Mark Murphy about this. And that's one of the exciting things about our generation is that it was so polarized years ago with Dawson versus Gelb and Gelb versus Panky. Uh, so I think it's just within that environment that it's exciting for me to have this conversation. So Lane, did you want to add anything to that? Did I, you know? And and it's really a testament to Michael Lauren because I don't want to say I poo pooed what Michael did before I really knew Michael, but I know a lot of dentists did, and I never understood it. And when I came to Michael's office, and I realized what he does with a lower gelb, and what his father and him really pioneered was repositioning the jaw forward. That's what we do in ortho. Right. We were having the conversation with Ben. We get someone's mandible forward because really in ortho, what happens is someone's mandibles back and they'll retract someone rather than guide someone's mandible forward. So when I got to Michael's office, I realized what he does with his lower gelb is what we do with bite block therapy in ortho or lip bumpers or other functional appliances to get the mandible forward. And that's really the thing. I mean, I screwed it up as a restorative dentist for 15 years. And I'll never get on a stage and say, hey, look at these great cases. I'll be like, I screwed this up because my bread and butter, like Michael was talking about big cosmetic practices, were worn down teeth. And I'd veneer people. And what would I do? I'd make their teeth longer and I'd trap their mandible back rather than understanding where do I need to get their mandible. And, I'm, and that's the thing. When Michael and I talk, the patient still needs dentistry. It just needs to be better than the way that I did it. Right. And I think the other thing is that, you know, if you go to a DSM courses, if you're using a mandibular advancement device at night and you're repositioning at night, that's kind of acceptable. You know, that's like status quo, that's evidence-based. But the minute you start talking about repositioning during the day, it's a dirty word. And I think that that dichotomy should not occur. And I you know, when I talk to you, Lauren, I talked to Ben about setting up, I'm the prequel. Lane and I are really setting up this potentially beneficial jaw position where the patient feels better, where we get rid of all their chief complaints, where potentially you could build the orthodontics to that position. And I think that's what leads up. And that's what my day-long course is about. But to some extent, tonight is a more introductory discussion, how do you as a general dentist get rid of jaw pain, neck pain, headaches, clicking? What do you do with the patient that's wearing down their teeth? Like, what? Do you, how do you make your night guard? And what's the best way? Or what are maybe other ways? And we're not going to say the best way, because it's going to be up to you. But what are other ways to think about the night guard and how can we maybe just open your mind up just to consider a few more things? So can I share my screen now? Uh, actually, not yet. I just want to take a quick poll and just welcome everyone. That was like the best introduction we possibly could have had <laughs> because it was very interesting and very intriguing about what we're going to learn tonight. But I do want to thank the audience for participating and being with us tonight. I always 
champion um, healthcare professionals that want to learn more and take the time to learn more. And let's find out a little bit about who we have with us tonight. I'm just going to launch a poll here um, to just choose the profession that best suits you. And we can kind of see who we have. And I'm sorry, I only have 10 options. So if your choice isn't up there, I apologize. Uh, but that's the best I could do with the 10 that I have. Okay, still coming in. Give it a couple more seconds. We have 68, 70% participated. Come on, guys, you can quick click who you are real quick. We have 400 registered today. I know we have about 142 on tonight, but I know people um, can access this at any time. So I'm really excited. And this will also be archived for you to share with your colleagues um, if you find this interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna share the result here. Um, here we do. We have the majority of dentists and uh, dental <laughs> hygienists followed by OMTs, SLPs, RDHs, other healthcare professionals. I'd love to see who that is. I saw a couple of chiropractors had registered tonight. So um, welcome to everybody. And we really appreciate you being here. No oral surgeons. I thought that's interesting. I thought we'd have a couple. And the one periodontist. So thank you so much for joining us. Okay. And a couple of orthodontists. Um, I did have another uh, poll. Well, let's see. Last time I wasn't so good at this. So let me see if I can do better at it this time. Um, about night guards. Okay, yes, it, it, it came up. I'm so excited. Do you prescribe traditional night guards in your office for bruxism um, if you are in the dental field? Oh, and here we go. So 67% yes. 20% no and not applicable for our other health care. So thank you for that information. I think that's helpful for you guys too, to see who our audience is. It's always nice to know. Um, I do have a few disclaimers and a few housekeeping items. So just bear with me here. The views presented are the opinions of our speakers and are not necessarily affiliated with Lauren Gates and Associates and Airway Health Solutions. The following webinar is provided for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute providing medical advice or professional services. The information provided should not be used for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease, and those seeking personal medical advice should consult with a licensed physician or dentist. Always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health providers regarding a medical or dental condition. Um, also, we are offering CE tonight. I'm really happy to do that. Um, it's a pleasure for us to provide that to you, but you do need to be on, and um, there is no need for a code or a survey because we are logged in with Zoom. Um, it tracks the software tracks your attendance. So we don't need to uh, follow up with that. If you're on, we give you the CE. If not, uh, we don't. It's pretty simple. At the end of our presentation, we're going to hold a live digital raffle where one lucky attendee attendee will win a free virtual admission to our Airway Palooza ticket March 15th and 16th. You have to uh, be in it to win it. So you have to stay on to the very end so we can do that raffle. Okay, so here we go. It's 8.13. We're right on schedule. Michael, why don't you take it away and we'll start the presentation. I'm looking forward to a robust discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. So night guards, I mean, in general, are they good in general, not just for the airway, for the TMJ, uh, for overall health and wellness? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an overall discussion. And so Ayurveda is, is the name that we came up with. It's how you can use appliance therapy for work, play, and sleep, which is um, a, a, uh, something that's used in occupational therapy. So, you know, Lane, Lane, Lane talks very well to this slide. And, you know, I had patients in today, and I, I, I really would say that Half of my adult patients, and maybe more, are either on Lexapro and Wellbutrin for anxiety, or they're on Adderall. And now they're, they're telling me there's a shortage of Vyvanse. So people are going back on, you can't get, Ad, you can't get uh, Vyvanse as much, I believe, anymore. So people are going back to Adderall. And a lot of people prefer the Vyvanse to the Adderall. But it's amazing how many adults and so what happens as a kid's problem, we go on and we see 
and that's kind of the shame of this lane you want to speak to this because this is a this yeah, is I, so I, you know if anyone's ever seen me lecture they'll they'd see me push this slide up but the next slide is showing a picture of a friend of mine who is a patient in my office who was 40 years old this isn't the patient but look somewhat similar to this and he died of sleep apnea he was 40 two young kids and he had worn down teeth and what did i do like a lot of dentists we treated his symptoms you know i fixed his teeth and i restored his vertical but i i missed his problem and, and really the point of a slide like this is showing like no one should walk in looking like this and if it happened in my office and it happened to a couple of patients, it's happening in everyone on this webinar. And that's really the message is that we're way more than just being procedurists and fixing teeth. Because these people, by the way, they see their dentist more than they see their physician. So it's really a captive audience. And when you see this now, it can't just be like, all right, the patient needs a night guard, but why does that patient look like that? And that's really the premise behind showing something like this. I think that's great. And what we see, what I see on Instagram all the time is that I'll see this case restored where some of our colleagues have figured out how to open up the vertical dimension. And so with this, you could say, you know, this patient has a reverse smile line. I'm going to lengthen the incisors. I'm going to open the vertical because I, I have to open the vertical because it's apparent. So at least people are... We're not back in 1978 when I started Columbia Dental School. We're not, we, 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 we no longer believe that you cannot restore vertical dimension. We know that the body will form new freeway space, but most people would look at this in terms of restorative dentistry, like Lane said. And I think one of Lane's frustrations with being in practice was that the patient would come back a year, two, three, four years later, and they would start fracturing. They would begin to fracture uh, the incisal edges. Is that correct, Lane, or a posterior tooth? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not only fracture incisal edges, but I spoke about it before. If I lengthen this person's teeth and I trap their mandible back, they're going to do CPR on themselves, right? And that's really what I talk to hygienists and dentists about. When you see wear on someone's front teeth, and they don't have a power of functional habit where they chew pens or their nails, they're doing CPR on themselves to open up their airway. And that was something else I missed too, because a lot of the patients would come in with maybe chips in the veneers and I'd take a Soflex this and I'd polish it rather than addressing like what caused that person to chip that. The other thing, and Michael spoke about opening up vertical, I didn't really understand this until I was in ortho. You know, we always think our vertical opens up this way, but when you open up vertical and a lot of patients, their mandible rotates clockwise. So a lot of times I didn't realize that some of those full mouth rehab cases, I actually made the patient worse. I checked their occlusion six months down the road and they were kind of postured forward. And that was something else that was kind of a red flag to me. And yeah, Lane, if you go into the Q&A, uh, you know, we're lucky to have uh, Stacey Ochoa on. And she wrote a great question. And certainly, I mean, yeah, absolutely. We're going to answer that tonight in terms of uh, the effect and what traditional and uh, what traditional flat plane appliances do. So let's let me keep going with this. And we're going to we're going to try to address everyone. So. This lane, this is just showing really the occlusals, the abfractions. Um, so when you see this kind of wear now, Lane, are you thinking that most of these patients have an airway problem? Tell, tell us your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, this is a therapist I met up in, so I'm a Navy veteran. He's at Annap He's not at Annapolis. He's actually at West Point. And I'm talking with him, I'm having breakfast with him, and I, I see his teeth are all worn down. And I asked him, you know, the question that we always ask, do you clench and grind? He's like, yeah, my dentist made me a night guard. And it was an upper flat plane night guard. And then I asked the questions more about his health, about blood pressure. He's got AFib. And then the next question was acid reflux. And he's like, yeah. And obviously, 
you could look at this and think this is erosion from, you know, acid, but it's just exacerbated by that. Because the same thing, if you look at him, he's posturing his jaw forward and his teeth will actually meet up a certain way. No, that's, that's a great point. And so the American College of Prosthodontics recommends that not just a case like this, but any wear case, this, this is an extreme case. They recommend that we, we order a home sleep test on these patients. And I think Lane and I are in agreement. We'd like to get a diagnosis prior to putting a night guard in. We'd like to get a night and we'd like to get a diagnosis. Now it's based someone in the work of Gerald Simmons. Uh, it's based on Nikopolu, Gagnon. It's, you know, if you read that American College of Prosthodontic paper, we know that if you just put in a regular guard that tends to distalize the mandible, that that can worsen sleep apnea. And we know that uh, clenching and bruxism is something that's associated with obstructive sleep apnea. So when we, something, we see something like this, we know that only 15% of patients with sleep apnea have been diagnosed. So high blood pressure, maybe 75% of patients have been diagnosed, diabetes, maybe 50% of those patients have been diagnosed. The patients with sleep disordered breathing, it's around 15, one five, 15%, could be 20, but maybe it was 11 or 12% 30 years ago. So we really haven't done very well in terms of increasing the number of our patients. And they're sitting in our chairs every day. Lane, tell us what percentage of the patients that are gonna be in hygiene tomorrow of our participants, or if there are chiropractors in here, what percentage of the people coming into their office are gonna have sleep disordered breathing tomorrow? I would say upwards of 60 to 65% of people that are walking into a dental office have an airway problem. I'm not talking sleep apnea because I think the metrics aren't great. I think a lot of those patients that are clenching and grinding, you know, that's the other thing. When I ask people, why does someone clench and grind their teeth? What's the answer? We normally get stress. And if you have listened to Michael or Jameson Spencer, you know, they're going to tell you it's stress from suffocating. Because think about it. We see kids that grind their teeth. And my response always is, did the three-year-old have a tough day at work? They're, they have a lot of times it's tonsils and adenoids and it's anatomy and obviously soft tissue. That's the other thing. This is a multifactorial problem. It's not, we could sit and talk about ortho, but it's nasal patency, it's soft tissue. And then what we're gonna do from an anatomical standpoint, that's the last piece. Right, also activation of the sympathetic nervous system, yeah. clenching, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so in my practice, and I got to say that still 70%, 75% of the patients that come in, patients come into practices because they're in pain, could be tooth pain, could be tooth sensitivity, could be clenching, could be chronic jaw pain, neck pain, could be headaches, broken teeth, chipped teeth. <laughs> the other reason <laughs> why patients go to physician is that they're tired, they're fatigued, they're exhausted. And so whether it's a thyroid problem, whether it's depression, whether it's hydration, um, that's the reason people come in. One third of my practice are ear symptoms. So that's tinnitus, ringing, fullness, and ear pain. That's a full 33% of the practice, which has been there since my father was in the practice. I think these are some of the reasons why patients are coming in aside from the traditional dental, these are the complaints that patients have that are sitting in your chair. And so I know we have some hygienists on today. This is really the reason they come in. And very often, like Lane was talking about, you'll see this kind of wear on the teeth, which, you know, Lane, you told the story that you couldn't figure out, right? but you realized when they postured forward, the teeth lined up perfectly. Is that, is that the story that you tell? It's one of them. And then, you know, the, obviously the other question is the opening the VDO. And because I used to leave people with a little bit of an anterior open bite restoratively. And 
about six months later, I used shim stock, very thin articulating paper. And a lot of those people postured forward. And, and someone asked in the chat about, you know, the, the vertical and prevent the mandible from rotating back. It's, it's really more of what I'm teaching a lot of our restorative dentists now is to set the case up with using a lower gelt. That's, that's kind of what we're doing is saying that we're going to use a better night guard. It's going to get someone's mandible in a better position. They're going to feel better. It's going to alleviate a lot of their symptoms, but it's a great way to set up an orthodontic case and a restorative case. No, that's a good point. And one thing that I'm looking at, when I'm looking at this slide, I notice the buttressing. Do you notice how the bone is buttressed on the maxilla? When I say buttress, can you see my arrow there, Lane? Yeah. Yeah. So the bone is buttressed on the maxilla. It's also a little buttressed. So if you took a comb beam, you would see a whole mountain range. You'd see a whole uh, addition of bone in that area. So this is a response to the clenching. And, uh, you know, I think Stacy makes a good point. And I, had, I really hadn't thought about it. But even with the flat plane guard, if you're clenching on that guard, I, I, I do agree that it could have a distalizing effect on the maxilla. And I hadn't really thought about that. Certainly, I think that 90% of the guards that I see coming in are made in a distalized terminal hinge retruded position. And I try to, I look at that every patient, I ask them to bring in their existing guard because I want to see if I can do anything. I want to see if I can help. And I'd have to say 90% are still made the way that we were taught to make night guards 40, 50 years ago. Not that I've been in practice that long. So, ooh, let's talk about this. So, this is a good slide. My favorite slide has all the centric relation positions on, but basically, Centric relation years ago, before 1982 or before 1985, starting in 1924, actually, with Stewart and Stallard and the fathers of nathology, they would put the jaw back in the 2 5 position. In other words, they would put the lower jaw posterior distalized back in the fossa because they wanted to have a repeatable position. They wanted to be in a bone on bone position. And I'd say that probably 30, 40% of dentists are still in that position. Uh, they haven't furthered their education. They're still doing what was done in 1924. Peter Dawson in 1982 or 1985, he changed the definition of centric relation in the glossary of prosthetic terms. And he said it should be basically like in the one four position. So it should be up against the articular eminence because this is where the fibrocartilage is. And there's fibrocartilage on the front of the condyle. So Dawson said it should be seated anterior. The disc should, should be interposed in between the condyle and the eminence. And basically my dad was saying it should be in the four seven position. It should be down and forward. It shouldn't be up and back. And that was like a heretical, that was, a heretical statement back in 1965, 1970, 1975. When Dawson said it should be in the 1-4 position, it's not like everyone right at, it's not like everyone followed Dawson and all of a sudden all the restorative dentistry was being made in the correct position. Things take 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years to really get into mainstream dentistry. One of the things that I figured out was that when you brought the jaw down and forward, because I started using comb beams, which my dad didn't have, and because we started using home sleep test, I could see very, very clearly that when you brought the jaw into that one, four or four, seven position, that you were opening the airway. And I hypothesized that people were getting better that had TMJ problems because you were giving them more oxygen and better restorative sleep. And I said, it wasn't really what you think. They're not getting better because of why you think they're getting better. And we've learned that a long time ago. We often don't really know why patients get better. And so anything that you can do to free up the mandible, let the mandible come forward, or let's say that's a dirty word, okay? So we're trying to restore to the, 
the jaw to where it ideally could be. And that's even a, you know, that's a, that's a difficult statement. Some people use a physiological position and that's, you know, it's difficult. Whenever you talk about changing jaw posture, um, I think it's difficult. Lane, why don't you, can you comment on this too, Lane, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, you know, whenever I go out and talk to a group and I've gotten to know Michael really well, we're business partners in a, in a couple of ventures, but I have to tell you that Michael and his father really pioneered airway. They really did because what they did was when Michael's father recognized to bring the mandible down and forward, I mean, we spoke about it. It brings the tongue forward, right? Someone's mandible comes forward. Think about it. So the questions I always ask is when's the last time you took CPR? What do you do to someone that has trauma? You jaw thrust them. That's why a lot of those patients are gonna have anterior wear. And especially the hygienists on this, a, a lot of times I always say you're the frontline defense for this because you're seeing these patients that by the time the dentist comes in, they're overwhelmed, they're busy, they're taking one quick peek. Uh, when I go and lecture to a group, I want the front desk there. I want the hygienist. I want the assistant and I want the dentist. And I want the, even the front desk person to start recognizing when someone looks the way they do. Right, because in orthodontics, we look at certain angles. We look at chin throat angle, labial mental fold, nasal labial angle. And a lot of times you'll be able to recognize even without a comb beam, without a sleep test that that person has an airway issue. And I think that's so important. And I really learned a lot of that from being in Michael's office. And obviously he has great technology with comb beam and being able to sleep test people. But the other point to make here is and Michael and I will argue this. We say, if you're making a night guard for a patient, that person needs a sleep test. And I, and I really believe that because why would you make a night guard for a patient? Because they're clenching and grinding. They're clenching and grinding because they probably have an airway issue. Unless they have a neurologic problem, but they probably have an airway problem. Great point. And Lane, talk, and, talk about the phonetic bite too, if you can. Yeah, so... You know, I used to put, start a lot of cases in CR. And the analogy I would use for CR is CR centric relation is like putting training wheels on a bicycle. You could start out there, but no one's going to really want to stay there. And the phonetic bite that I, and that's the other thing, I, I learned that from Michael from being in the office because I didn't really know, like, where do you take a bite for a night guard? Do you leave them in centric occlusion? And it's very similar to taking a bite for a mandibular advancement device. Really what you do is you have the patient say the sibilant sounds. So Mississippi, 66. And what happens when you say those sounds, your mandible comes down and forward. And a lot of times your midlines line up. And that's kind of an argument and a paradigm shift of taking someone's mandible to a different position. But really when you bring them there, their pain is gone. A lot of times their ear issues are gone. They're going to feel better. Yeah, Lane, I, I want to make a comment. You know, I've become friendly with uh, Frank Salenza Jr., Franz. And, you know, uh, Frank, Salenza, Frank Salenza Sr., Vinny's father as well, he coined the term long centric. And that's because when they would put the patient into a 2 5 position, or a one-two position, they would notice, like you noticed, Lane, that the patient would come back six months later, a year later, and they'd be postured forward. And so they built in a little slide. They built in the ability, where well, they called it long-centric, for the jaw to be able to come forward on its own. And I think that that, for me, that's very interesting. And it's a very astute finding that Frank Salenza Sr. had and I think that was on the way to then Dawson changing his definition, still not really understanding, I don't think, TMJ and not totally understanding. Certainly no one understood airway at that time, but I think that it's important for us to look at that, you know, that history. So Lane, talk about, you know, because this is what I see on some of my friends on social media that are trying to advertise their full mouth restoration courses. They want to show us. So when they show us these long incisors, Lane, uh, what, what, what do you make of this? Well, I mean, this is, this is a case I did. And 
when this patient walked in, I was probably licking my chops to say like, all right, this is going to be a fifty, sixty thousand dollar case. But just like I said before, I treated this person's symptoms. I, I, I didn't fix the problem here. It really, that's not the picture of their bite, right? Because their bite is exactly what I did. I probably left them with a certain overjet and overbite. And, and I'm sure this patient at some point came back and had some broken restorations too. So you think by making those incisal edges longer, you really trapped the, you trapped the mandible back. You had no intention of bringing the mandible down and forward at that time in your career. Absolutely not, which is why a lot of these patients came back with broken crowns or chipped veneers anteriorly. And, and that would happen a lot. At least once a week, my hygienist would come get me and be like, Lane, Mrs. Jones has a chip in her veneer on number eight or upper right one. So basically, and instead of, yeah, the patient wants to live, right? They want to survive. They don't care that there's porcelain in the way. That draw is going to keep coming forward the way it did. Absolutely. Like on 27, the way that that wear is there, it was there for a reason. The same thing on number 11 with that wear and the tooth splaying out like that. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we'll probably get to this point, but the, I don't want to say the knock, but people that don't understand this and, and I'm, I feel like my job now is kind of bridging the gap between what Michael and his father pioneered and they really were ahead of their time and talking to the restorative dentist like myself that didn't understand it and made a lot of mistakes. And it's really talking about people's bites changing, but it's not necessarily that their bites changing, their mandibles coming into a position. And the other thing I always talk about is your teeth should touch for 15 minutes a day. You have to breathe for 1,440 minutes. What's more important, having straight teeth or staying alive? And I think it's a really, really important point. Yeah, so let, let's go to the question just because I want to make sure we answer that. Lane, so Stacy, yeah, thank you. But I also agree, Stacy. no doubt, no doubt that 90% of the guards dis distalize the mandible. That 100% agree with. But I even think you could be right that no one's really talked about that because of all the force, especially if there's a ramp on it, which I tend to use, that will tend to distalize the maxilla while the lower end teeth will come forward. Lane, I want you to address, when you open the vertical lane, how do you control for that clockwise rotation that actually closes the airway? How do you, how do, you do that? So I, I just said it. I, I would start a lot of these patients in a lower gelb because if they're coming in like that i need to set their mandible to a better position and what's going to happen is they're going to remodel because the people that don't understand this are going to say well the person's bite's going to change i want their bite to change what right. happened when i used to open up vertical and it, it didn't happen all the time and it's not going to happen in every patient but you can get them rotating clockwise and when you rotate clockwise, obviously your mandible goes back, your tongue goes back, and the person's going to not feel as good. Okay, that's great. Um, and then in terms of the, and Stacy brought up a great point. When Michael and I talk, this is a Band-Aid. Right? A night guard, a sleep appliance, a lot of times it's a Band-Aid. It really is getting the patient feeling better and sleeping better and then figuring out a better solution. But what happens is dentists need to understand snoring and sleep apnea, it's an incurable disease. It's just like diabetes. You can mitigate symptoms unless you get a kid before the age of 10, you could, you could cure a kid. But for an adult, it's really about managing their symptoms. So uprighting molars, giving someone better tongue space, you know, palatal expansion, getting them breathing better through their nose, or even you could do it restoratively as well. Good point. So the primitive night guard, and someone asked what a gelb is, but the primitive night guard, I'd say it's an upper, it's either an Essex, it's a punch out. They're sometimes soft. We call them chewy toys because patients tend to clench more on the soft uh, guards. Very often they're made by Glidewell or another lab. They're upper, they're canine guidance. They're made to a terminal hinge position. 
Um, we, Lane and I, so that's the primitive night guard. And they do, they can prevent teeth from, from wearing down. They can, they do prevent um, restorations from breaking, but they close the airway at least 50% of the time. I think they close the airway approximately 90% of the time. So Lane and I set out to make a healthy night guard, Ervada, for work, play, and sleep. That means it's used for the day and it's used at night. Uh, that's a picture of Ervada. And uh, it's an upper and a lower. There's a ramp on it. And we really should show a schematic of that lane, I think, so they can see it. But the upper component yeah. has a ramp on it. And there's straps on the side so the lower jaw doesn't fall back at night. So it's really made into that anterior, the phonetic position, the speaking position, a comfortable position. Um, um, Michael, could you, could you go back to that slide for a sec? Yeah. <laughs> so something super important to understand, when the lower part of the Arvada is really the same thing as a lower gelb, except there's incisal edge coverage. But if you notice, on the cuspids, there's like significant indexing and you can kind of see it through the elastic as it goes back, there's indexing. So basically what happens is when we take a phonetic bite and have the patient say the sibilant sounds, their mandible is going to come down and forward. That's where we kind of register that person. It's the same, it's kind of the same thing as taking a sleep bite. I know a lot of people use different, you know, adjuncts, either a George gauge or a pharyngometer, there's, the, you know, there's airway metrics, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But really the premise of every one of these appliances is not how far forward you can bring the jaw, it's preventing it from falling back. But when you have that indexing there, this patient could wear this during the day, just the lower, if they're working out, if they're stressed at work, if they're studying, and then you put the upper part in at night, and then the elastic is kind of the belts and suspenders. But what Stacy brought up too is this is a band-aid. And what happened was the reason Michael and I designed the elastic this way is a lot of the oral appliances I did when I worked for an ENT had almost like a class two elastic. So it was upper cuspid, lower molar. And if someone is a mouth breather and they open up and their mandible rotates back, the elastics were breaking. The other thing is it dissipates the forces because if someone wears this long-term, it's the same thing as class two elastics. You brought up the maxilla, the maxilla could auto rotate back. If someone wears an appliance like this really long-term with a heavy elastic. So the elastic on the side of our appliance is a 40 durometer. So it's, you know, we measure durometers in a lot. We measure elastics in durometers this is really a light elastic on the side of that. We really want the indexing and then the ramp to really help keep the patient forward at night and not rely so much on the elastic. Right, so the night guard, it's a Band-Aid. It's, you could use it for three months. You could use it for six months, three years. You could use it for 10 years. But we understand that orthodontics is probably, in most cases, the best way to to fix this problem, to stabilize the airway, to make more room for the tongue, to improve nasal breathing. But this is, we're trying to reach out and at least improve what is thought of to be the basic night guard. Why people often say no to sleep appliances, uh, they don't work, physician ENT says they don't work. A lot of them are too bulky. When I go back 30 years and I see what we made 30 years ago, it's, almost comical, but some, a lot of patients tolerate it there. They say they cause bite changes, which they certainly can do if you don't use an AM aligner. And Lane has introduced a great AM aligner, hard to wear with CPAP, hard to make for a patient. Lane, and they a lot of people say that these sleep appliances cause TMJ. You want to comment, Lane, comment on that? Um, I think it's the opposite. I think it resolves a lot of TMJ. I think that the beauty of our appliance is it's really thin. I, you know, I think what happened when Michael and I first got together, I realized that a lot of the appliances were bulky and not comfortable. And 
I was like, all right, what could you do on every single patient that walks into an office? You can make them a clear aligner. And, and that was kind of the premise behind what we did. Bite changes, a lot of times, why would I want to leave someone who's skeletal class two? Why would I want to leave them trapped back? I, I want their, not necessarily their bite to change, I want their mandible to come forward. And that's really all a sleep appliance or a lot of these appliances are. They're the same thing as a functional appliance in ortho. Uh, hard to wear with CPAP now because it's thin. And that's another question, especially if you're kind of astute with airway and you've taken a lot of courses, I always ask the patient what pressure their CPAP is set at. Because if their pressure is too high, a lot of times what you could do is you can give them an oral appliance. They could use combination therapy. It could take the pressure down. And is it hard to make for patients? No. You either take an impression or you could send an intraoral scan. Lane, let me ask you a question. So look, I tell you, the lower gel, it's a lower appliance. It covers the cuspids, uh, cuspid guidance. It gives indexing. It's an indexed appliance. It's not a flat appliance. It's usually made in the four seven position. Lane, I want to ask you a question. This is the, uh, you know, Giancarlo Samante, what are the facial features to look for to recognize airway issues? I don't think we have time to talk about that. But typically, Bimax retrusive, you know, Kevin Boyd has, has shown us and McNamara has shown us that most maxillas are back and most mandibles are back. Long face, mouth breather, narrow maxilla, high palatal vault, sunken in under the eyes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, Lane, Sheldon Chu asked real quick, why do you need a sleep study prior to fabricating the Arvada? Well, because we think a lot of the people that have this problem or that clench and that have these symptoms that need a night guard, they probably have a sleep disorder. Um, well, and the other thing is you're screening, every, a lot of dentists screen patients for blood pressure and you should be screening everyone for oral cancer. You have to screen their airway. Yeah. You're sitting right there, you're looking at it. Someone asked, bad bites cause bad joints. Let me, let me get through more of this and we'll come back. So, oh, the other thing I wanted to say so Lane's point is for people that are not compliant, and this is Leslie asked this question, a lot of people will start off with the lower part of the Ayurveda. So patients are always more compliant with a lower appliance, full coverage than with a upper and lower or with an upper. So for gaggers, for example, it's just easier to wear lower. Lane, what's your comment about you would never make an upper guard, you would always start with a lower full coverage? Yeah, I mean, you know, you and I pulled the, the dental lab. So I think 98% of night guards ordered at labs across the country are upper flat plane night guards. And uh, I'm kind of jumping in here, but what I did was, and Michael showed the slide, I used to take these patients that had a deficient upper jaw, narrow buckle corridors, and I veneered them. I fixed their symptom. And then I would give them this night guard and say, you know what, Mrs. Jones, this is your insurance policy that your veneers won't break. But really what I did was I took up tongue space on someone that had a deficient maxilla. And when their mandible hits a flat plane splint, guess which direction it's going back. So these are the patients that would always come in and say, Lane, I found my night guard on the floor. And what would I do? I would take the night guard and I'd start grinding on the intaglio surface of the night guard, but I didn't realize really, I made the wrong appliance for that patient because I treated their symptoms and I missed their problem. So I know you should never say never in dentistry, but you should never make an upper night guard for a patient. Unless it's a fairer and it has a ramp, you should never make an upper night guard. You, you're better off making a lower in center occlusion because it's like, I use the analogy, if I bang my head against the wall and then I put a football helmet on, I'll eventually get some damage to my brain. But it's the same thing with a lower night guard. You really want to have the repositioning component like what Michael and his father developed. Thank you, Lane. That's great. Let me keep going and I'll get to uh, Michael. We'll, we'll leave five minutes to the end to address the questions. Uh, so let me go to the next slide. Hold on. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the question is, when do you use the lower Ayurveda, the lower part? When do you tr just use the lower part 
or a lower gelb. The Ayurveda is full coverage. The gelb is segmental. If there's an anterior open bite, we're always going to use a full coverage. In other words, whenever there's an anterior open bite, we're not going to use a gelb. We're going to give the patient anterior guidance. Let's say they come in complaining of clicking and popping and locking. You're going to use a lower appliance for the day that alleviates the clicking and the popping. The lower appliance is used for six to eight weeks as a cognitive behavioral device to teach the patient to keep their lips together, their teeth apart with the tongue, up to the palate, breathing through the nose with good posture. If they have fullness during the day, if they have tinnitus ringing during the day, you'll use a lower appliance. If they have ear pain during the day because either the masseter, the sternocleidomastoid is referring into the ear or because there's capsulitis or retrodiscitis. If there's neck pain and you need the oral device, you need the lower air vada to help stabilize C1 and C2, the cervical spine, because they're working with the physical therapist, the jaw and the neck are very closely related. So if the patient's working with Jake Klein, who's a chiropractor who's on the call, who's excellent, who's in my office two days a week and has his own practice, the appliance, and I used to work with his dad, David Klein, the appliance stabilizes the cervical spine. They work together. Neck pain, dysfunction, and imbalance. Now, if the patient complains that their symptoms are worse in the morning when they wake up, you need to use an Ervada. You need to use a nighttime appliance. If the patient wakes up with their jaw locked, you need to keep the jaw in the therapeutic position while the patient sleeps. And the Ervada is great at that. Joint pain. If the patient has a narrowed airway and they're clenching, the Ervada is going to maintain an open airway. And if the jaw is shifting to the right, it's shifting to the left. So if they sleep on their right, it'll go to the right. If they sleep on the left, it goes to the left. If they sleep on their back, their jaw goes back. You need to keep the jaw in the proper position with the Ayurveda. And also if they have nighttime clenching, you want to use an Ayurveda. The problem with using a lower appliance, if they're clenching, if their jaw goes back at night because of gravity, they may only contact on the second molars and actually can make their pain worse. Lane, do you want to add anything to the... Um, lower in uh, the nighttime and daytime? The only, the only thing I would say is, is really almost like a branch if a patient comes in. So it, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of people treating kids here, but if a child comes in grinding their teeth, snoring right away, pediatric ENT, and, and most of the times right into ortho and myofunctional therapy. An adult, different scenario. An adult comes in with a lot of these issues. We need to prove we can get them feeling better and sleeping better prior to doing ortho. I mean, obviously I would vote for doing ortho, but the patient can't breathe through their nose. They have a soft tissue problem and you'll see this a lot. Tons of people are tongue tied. Their mandibles are trapped back. The last piece is putting them into ortho or restorative dentistry. And what Michael and I were talking about is this is really a band-aid. This is the prequel to either ortho or restorative, restoring someone in a better position. And But you will have patients that are just going to be like, you know what? No, I want to wear this appliance. I'm fine. And that's fine. And someone asked a question about the AM aligner in the chat. We make an AM aligner for every single patient. And I would say the same thing. The way I handle dentistry is that every patient I treat, I think they're going to end up suing me. And that's how I treat every single patient. So I make an AM aligner for everyone. It's a cover your ass tactic. But if the patient's going to go into ortho or restorative, I don't want them to use the AM aligner. Good, same. And I also say the lower appliance lane, we recommend that everyone use it for weightlifting. They can use it for yoga, Pilates, driving. And I say, the lower appliance is used long-term for midterms and finals. So we, yeah. get through, we get them through high school, we get them through college, we get them through law school. It's really for stress. And instead of putting a drug in your mouth, you could put an appliance in for 30 seconds. 
hopefully cognitively and behavior behaviorally learn how to keep your lips together, teeth apart. Yeah, and Michael, a, a quick question about, uh, a quick statement about that. My friend's daughter is a division one lacrosse player, has had jaw pain, clicking, popping for seven years. And finally, they let me like take a look at her. They live in Florida. I saw her probably about a month and a half ago. And same thing, she was trapped back, had ortho, and you know she was having a ton of pain. But the interesting thing was, I did exactly what Michael taught me. I put my pinkies in her ears. You could feel her kind of pounding on that retrodiscal tissue. But as soon as I made her a lower part of our appliance, not only did it get rid of her jaw pain, but she called me two days later and said, I can't even tell you, I am breathing so much better when I'm working out. Because what was happening is her mandible was trapped back. Our appliance brought her forward. It really opened up her airway. And it started promoting her to be able to breathe through her nose. That's great. So performance lane is a big part of what we do. We're really into performance. Yeah. So although we talk about these other things, we're also very much into performance. And the promises are, when you wear the Irvada, you're going to wake up refreshed. You're not going to snore. We're going to make promises that the other night guards could never deliver on. The jaw is not going to drop back. You'll wake up in a better mood. You'll actually look better in the morning. You'll be more refreshed. So you'll, you will help manage the clenching. clenching. So we make the lower part of the Ayurveda can stand on its own, like you see here. It'll, there'll be cuspid guidance, and there should be anterior guidance. And I don't know that you, know, you could see that here. But the lower portion of the Ayurveda, which is an upper and lower, can stand on its own during the day. Um, and like yoga, performance, breathing, like Lane said, we think it's a great uh, guard. Lane, I just want to address q and A. I know we're going to yeah. get Aaron soon. So um, Michael Steinberg, if a patient's regular occlusion has the midlines off, but they line up when they open, and the sleep appliances with the midlines lined up, why put the AM liner back in? Well, you know what? If someone is committed, Michael, to going forward to the next step, we have the conversation with people, and we agree with you. If they're okay with the bite changing, then you know we we don't put the AM aligner in. And someone asked the question, Michael, what an AM aligner is. So basically, what it is is it's a jig that you make in someone's centric occlusion or their habitual bite. So a patient comes in. The way I started doing it, and I learned this from again from Michael and Jameson is that the day I scan a patient for an oral appliance or a lower gelb, I'll make them the AM aligner so they get used to wearing it. And what it is, is you just take them in their centric occlusion or habitual bite. Because what's going to happen is, we, we were talking about it, when you put in a lower gelb or an oral appliance or a mandibular advancement device, you're going to bring the person down and forward. What's going to happen is they're going to remodel and a lot of people are going to stay in that position. So their bite might change to this position. If they're going to commit to doing orthodontics or restorative, I want them here. It's a better position for them. They're going to feel better. They're going to breathe better. And then it's a matter of either you build up the posterior teeth. You can use on laser crowns, or you can go ahead and do orthodontics and procline the teeth or extrude teeth if necessary. But I, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. But, the, but that's the point of why you would use an AM aligner or you wouldn't. And just real right. quick. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Lauren. No, I was going to say, I'm glad we're getting to answer these questions because we are having a master class also on October 11th. Uh, it's a little bit longer. We'll have a little bit more time for discussion on bruxism in general with uh, Ben, yourself, and Dr. Gerald Simmons, too. So um, a lot of these, I have a lot of ancillary questions here that we can address on our next master class. But you guys are doing such a great job. And the way you're presenting is just answering a lot of these questions. So I know we didn't have a formal Q&A, but you guys are just doing such a great job at really addressing a lot of these mysteries about night guards. So Lauren, um, Ruth Edwin asks, which lab makes Cervada? Do you just want to make a comment? Do they need to take... Uh... Of course, do they need to get that like you you and I have discussed? 
Yeah, so basically um, we became uh, partners with Airvada because you need to become an Airvada provider. And because Dr. Gelb is on AHS faculty, it makes perfect sense because he's been using these appliances. So we like for our faculty to teach what they use. So now we've incorporated our education, Dr. Gelb's course to provide access to become an Airvada provider. So you would um, take Dr. Gelb's course, it's a one day course. Actually, I could share my screen and just do some updates here. We could talk a little bit about the course, Michael, if, uh, let me go ahead and do that. Yeah, it was a natural partnership because this is what you're doing. You evolved as well, you know, so so as you evolve, we evolve. And that's why we decided all we were kind of on the same page here. So your course will address um, how to, why don't you go through, uh, Michael, some of the learning objectives and what the participant will learn after the course and have access to. Sure, we go over a basic, you know, TMJ diagnosis. We go over occlusion. We go over how things got to be the way they are. Uh, maxilla, maxilla placement, uh, narrow maxilla. We then integrate that with the comb beam. We do a lot on the comb beam, how we would explain it to the patient, how the comb beam really is a great way for us to become better at ENT. We evaluate the nose, deviated septums, turbidates. We look obviously at the condyles. We look at airway space. We show you the measurement that you can make on the maxilla that added like $2 million to my practice. Uh, which I think I, I never realized that. But once I started looking at that one measurement, it was a, it was a huge, just eye-opener for me. How do you take the bite for the appliances? How do you take the bite for the Arvada? How do you take the bite for the lower gelb? Um, and then how do you integrate Arvada hey, practice? And then one of the questions was, how long do you wait before you go into ortho? Um, I think that's really important. Um, so we would discuss that, um, you know, working with speech language pathology, working with myofunctional therapy. So it's really TMJ as the prequel to airway and as the prequel to orthodontics. Yeah, and we're super excited. And for those who have taken your mini residency, you know, a lot of our alumni, we have over 400 dentists now, they've taken your, I guess, course you know, 1.0, this is 2.0, and we are offering audits for those who've taken them. So everyone who is an alumni, whether you're the class of 22 or 2023, please check your email um, from info at airwayhealthsolutions.com and you have an invitation to audit uh, because we want to keep you in the loop on our latest developments. We're also adding a 30-day access to the recordings because a lot of people like to look back at that. And then we also thought it was really important to have that in-office shadowing. You know, it's one thing to learn about it conceptually, but it's always great to have that hands-on. Um, so Dr. Gelb is, is really grateful um, and offering to do a half-price in-office shadowing in New York City so that he does take one doctor at a time and you have you know a year to do that but we really want you to take advantage of seeing um, I brought my own son to Dr. Gelb's office for treatment and I learned so much by just going and seeing <laughs> seeing it in action so um, we highly recommend that we try to make it accessible for you so to learn more you can go to our website we are going to extend the collaboration cures that we had from the AAPMD meeting uh, for collaboration 10 for 10% 10 off. And we are offering 50% off of the in-office shadow. So happy to talk to you more about that. Um, Michael, you want to just talk about kind of what they will expect spending the day with you? Besides your, your jokes? <laughs> What's that? Besides your jokes? <laughs> Joking around, having a good time, seeing Patients, you know, listen, I do, I'm very good at what I do clinically. You're going to see it. Uh, I know a lot of a lot of doctors hide what they do. They, they can talk about it in the lecture, but they can't really walk the walk. Lane and I are in, in and out all the time. It's, you know, we've always had people study with us. People come in and out and we look at these patients and they kind of understand that they're in a special place. And my goal is just to turn my knowledge over to you guys so that you can implement it in your practices. So feel free to ask the patients questions. There'll be new patients. There'll be follow-up patients. There'll be Ayurveda inserts. There'll be people coming back with Ayurvedas. There'll be gelbs. 
um, and there'll be mandibular advancement devices. There, you, you basically will see everything. Uh, right, and maybe even a surprise visit from uh, Lane, right? Since you're around the corner sometimes. <laughs> could be to talk be, about it, yeah. That would be great. Um, I'll just tell you some more about just some upcoming because we're coming up to the top of the hour. I, I did take some extra time um, because you guys did such a wonderful job presenting and answered a lot of the questions through your presentations. Uh, but some upcoming events we have is we have our adult mini residency this Friday. We do have a couple of spots open. And then we have our other pediatric mini residencies and adults uh, through the remainder of the year. So you can reach out to me for more information. Really excited about Dr. Brett Christensen's mini residency. Uh, it's a wonderful course. He basically just teaches what he does. Everyone does things differently, and you'll learn so many pearls from him for doing this uh, close to 40 years now. So he's an orthodontist. So we invite orthodontists, peer-to-peer, -peer, general dentists, pediatric dentists to come spend the day with us and learn about Dr. Christensen's tricks. Dr. Boyd's course is coming up October 7th and 8th. We're also making it available on demand, so you can reach out to me, and we are offering shadowing specials as well. So any, any um, curiosity, you want to know more, let's set up a call, and I'll talk to you about that. And then we have, a, we're busy this season. We have our advanced course October 13th and 14th with Dr. Ben Moralia to learn about fixed expansion for older teens, as well as a bracket and wire system with springs, the carrier SLX system, which will be expansive in nature. So that is a must-see course, um, good for your toolbox. A lot of our dentists are on our airway dentist locator. Once you take one of our mini residencies, we will add you to the locator. Just today, um, I had a doctor reach out, excuse me, a patient reach out to find an airway dentist near her. I get these daily, many calls daily. So you will get new patients from being on our airway dentist locator. So that's a nice perk and we are global. We also have our Mayo courses. I know you guys are both big on Mayo. Um, Brittany Sierra um, Murphy and Carice Laguerre, they're experts. They walk the walk. They talk the talk. They're very passionate about what they do, and they bring that passion forward so you can be successful as a myofunctional therapist with different offerings. So please take a look at that if you're interested. I'm so excited for our Airway Palooza. Uh, Lane and Michael will be our speakers as well as other faculty and many familiar faces here. Uh, it's two days, um, a celebration. The first day is pediatrics where we're gonna review different um, talks from different experts. They're about 45 minutes each and you're gonna learn many pearls. And we're really gonna celebrate the, the road less traveled with airway dentistry, myofunctional therapy and just being ahead of the curve. So it's a big celebration. Everything's included, soup to nuts, music, food, Food, uh, wine, everything, but mostly the good spirits that's contagious. So we hope you will join us for that. Um, there are coupon, coupon codes that we're going to send out to you in your follow-up email. So please look through that to take advantage of it. Join our health Airway Health Meetup Facebook group. It's um, public for our professionals. So please join that. You can get more connected and learn more tips and tricks. Uh, save the date, Wednesday, October 11th, we're having our free master class, two, uh, free two and a half CE units. Uh, we're really going to dive into bruxism, TMD, and airway health. So some of these questions that weren't answered today, uh, save the date, and we'll be sure to answer them on the 11th. So that's going to be an exciting event. And I'm really excited. Uh, my partner in crime, I think Rebecca is on the call with us. Rebecca St. James is the um, executive director at Children Airway First. Um, Foundation, we're going to be doing a parent town hall. So this is the first time we're going to be hosting this together, uh, where everyone who's on here, I'm sure you have parents who have so many questions about sleep disorder breathing, what to do with their children, the different type of treatments. So um, we're going to open up for an open town hall Q&A with Dr. Ben Moralia. So please take advantage of that. That will be on our website shortly, but for now you can go to the Children Airway First Foundation website where they're doing some great updates and we're partnering up on that to make access free and all the information available to those who need it. So mark the date. November 8th, Wednesday from 7.30 to 9. Uh, here is their website. So um, don't be shy and come visit us there. And that is a wrap for us. But I did promise uh, a raffle. But before I do so, um, were there any questions here that I know you guys are scanning through in the Q&A that you think would be um, appropriate to answer just based on kind of everything we talked about this evening? Any, anything jump out at you? While I was going through that, um, 
Not really. I think we, we said a lot of things. Yeah. I, so okay. I, I, I think, just want to make sure because I wasn't looking at the questions while I was presenting. Else? The, the only thing I would say, and, and I mean, I'm going to sound a little bit biased, but I think prior to meeting Michael, I, I was pretty terrified of someone that walked in with TMD problems and I would refer them to a specialist. I, actually, it was not someone else that was in the city. And I think Michael demystifies a lot of what is really available to learn about TMD and he simplifies it. And that's one of the big things that I go into offices now and I teach is exactly what I learned from Michael. And it's really simplifying the patient's and getting them their jaw in a better position. I mean, there's other things, and obviously there's disc displacements and, and things that you will learn from Michael in his residency, but it's really something to be in his office and watch him do it. And uh, you know, I always say it's like a choreographed routine. It, it's really something to see in there. And I, agree. I really am fortunate that, you know, I said it when I had dinner with Lauren and Ben, I've been around some amazing people that have been mentors of mine from, you know, Jim Jacobs to Larry Rosenthal to John Coyce to Michael Gelb to Manny Alakani, my ortho director. So I've been really, really lucky and now obviously to join with Lauren and Ben and, and have Michael. So I think this is an amazing group. And I think that everyone on this call is really just trying to help their patients get better. And, I know. And I applaud everybody. <laughs> All of you. I mean, yeah. we'll going up because you keep registering. That's what we say. And that's what we promise um, to bring you. So thank you for your commitment. Just a quick question, Michael, is this course good for pediatrics and teens? How would you answer that? You know, I would say yeah. that Jeremy's doing most of that, you know, having studied with Ben. So I would say what you're going to see is that what my father taught is that when you miss something, in a six-year-old or a 12-year-old, I'm going to see it in the 18 right. and the 25-year-old. And what I see could have been prevented when they were much younger. Unfortunately, most dentists are still missing it. So if you will see, and Kevin talks about it too, you're going to see the malocclusion, same problem. If it wasn't addressed, it's going to come back and it's going to be it's going to be worse at 25 or 35 or 45 and more difficult to treat but still treatable right well thank you both so much for your time let's go and do this raffle because i want to give away a free airway palooza ticket i love this virtual wheel and let's see you have to be in it to win it so hopefully <laughs> let's see who who's our lucky winner today Well, the suspense of it all. Very exciting. <laughs> I was like real time. It's going to pop up, right? Okay, Sean Bannon. Is Sean Bannon on? Let's check. Let's check our participants. Here we go. Yes, Sean, Sean Bannon. Congratulations. We will reach out to you. You are a winner of our Airway Palooza virtual ticket. Um, so we're excited that you'll be with us and you'll see all of our uh, expert panels. And it's going to be an amazing, amazing event. So congratulations. And uh, we're at the top, the 913. So I apologize for running over tonight. But again, you guys did such a fabulous job. There's no way I can stop you short. So uh, thank you for sharing your expertise. And we're really looking forward to this partnership. Ultimately, it's going to uh, help more people breathe, sleep, and thrive. Thanks to all of you for helping our mission come true. And we'll see you on October 11th. Mark your calendars. Thanks. Thanks Good night, everybody. That was great. Thank you.